we want it to be simple. And there is a way that it is simple, but the simplicity is that learning how to hold the contradictions mm -hmm. and getting big enough to understand that two things can be true at the same time. And how do we metabolize that in our bodies? How do we show up in challenging situations and have our hearts stay open? Hey guys, welcome to episode number 217 of the Gay Mom Girlfriend podcast. Today, you are going to listen to, I think, a really inspiring conversation with Heather Ash Amara. This woman, Warrior Goddess, is the name of her domain. We love this already, right? But this woman has written nine books. She has faced unbelievable adversity inside her business and been able to overcome it. And she's just a joy to listen to. She's one of those women who has really cracked open the code to what we need to feel free internally and what we need to understand that our inner knowing is probably going to be our best guide. Heather Ash's books include the best-selling Warrior Goddess Training, The Seven Secrets of Happy and Healthy Relationships with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., and her upcoming book, Wild, Willing, and Wise. She skillfully and unconditionally guides people to shift from self-judgment to discernment, from victimhood to authentic vulnerability, and she helps us shed limiting domestication so we can ground into the self-intimacy, steadiness, and stillness that exists all around us. She was raised in Southeast Asia. Heather Ash has traveled the world from childhood and is continually inspired by the diversity and beauty of human experience expression, and experience. She brings this open-hearted, inclusive worldview into her writings and teachings. One of the things I hope you listen for inside this episode is how she overcame something in her business I hope none of us ever deal with, has to do with wildfires. It's heart-wrenching and quite profound. So I hope you listen in for that. This will be one of those interviews that's going to stick with you that you'll come back to and listen to whenever you're feeling stuck. So pop in those earphones and let's get to it. Heather Ash, welcome to the Game on Girlfriend podcast. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks, Sarah. So happy to be here. Yeah. So we have a lot to dive into. And you guys, we were talking before we hit record about all the fun things we want to chat about. But Heather Ash, I really want to know, I think what you do is so interesting and, and it really has that unique pull of like you, like you are in your business, you are like doing the things. And I just have to ask of all the things on planet earth that you could have chosen to do with your life. Why is this what you do? <laughs> Such a good question. You know, when I was seven years old, I decided I was going to write a book and I sat down and I had my pen and I started writing and I realized, I don't think I'm old enough to write a book. I think I need more life experience. And so I went on with my life, obviously, and started finding different teachers and having lots of experiences and started working at other women's businesses when I was in college. So I just had this string of working with women that were running their own businesses. I was a journalist. I was writing for the college newspaper. And then I started working for a publishing company, Amber Allen Publishing, that published my mentor at the time, Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements. And I was a publicist for them. And so here I am like in this world of books and my, my boss, Janet was like, you can write a book. You should write a book. You can do this. You can teach. I would always ask me, what's your dream? And I'm like, if I could have anything, I would just write and teach. That's what I want to do. And she just kept encouraging me. And, and one day she was like, I think you're ready. I'll help you. Somebody believing in me, me having this just urge in my being. I like, I was the shyest person ever. Like I did not want to speak in front of people, but I started finding, I was so passionate about sharing what I was doing and what I was learning about that. It just started coming out of me and it overrode my introvert shyness. And now I just love what I do. I get to travel around the world. I get to teach women. I write, I've written nine books now, and I run a company that is 500,000 a year, 10 employees, and we all have fun together. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it's so great, right? Cause it's like, I feel like so many times we like read headlines or we look at other people and it's like, I call on Oprah all the time. I'm like, look at what this woman's done. And people are like, yeah, yeah, but that's Oprah. Right. So it's so great what we see like, no you can actually be guided by all of the hundreds, maybe dozens, right? The dozens to hundreds of people in our lives that come in and like drop little whisperings like Janet did. Like, no, you can do this. This is a thing you can go do. What was it like for you writing that first book? Oh my God, it was so terrible. 
I wrote it completely from my head. First draft. I was just like, like I knew what I wanted to write about. And I was so under stress and like, I have to do this perfect. It's so like, I wanted it to be perfect. And I looked at after the first draft, I'm like, this is terrible. And I literally threw it out. Really? I it over. Yeah. I was like, this is not what I, this is not representative. And I went out and kind of like played and did more hiking. I just realized I have to get out of my head. I know this material. And then finally, after just enough time of letting go, it just came out. Um, yeah. Interesting. So it was yeah. an actual like, did it feel like a little bit somatic for you almost the way you're describing that? I'm wondering, like, was that like almost a physical feeling that like, oh, I got the, I would say to my kids, I'm like, vomit out the first draft. And then you're probably exactly. going to throw it out. Was it kind of like that? It really was. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I find about writing now is like people think writing is just sitting in front of the typewriter, or the computer and doing it. But for me, writing is hiking bathtubs, like talking with friends, like all of it is bringing the information in. And, you know, it's, it's a hard profession. Writing is not an easy choice of things to do because the amount of tension that you have to hold in your body for something to, new to come through is pretty intense. But then when it does like, oh, it's yeah. so good. It's the best feeling ever. Oh, but that's so interesting. So when you're writing it, you, I love how you just described that. So you're sitting, you feel like you hold a lot of tension in your body. Is that just to actually, I almost want to say have the discipline. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but to have that discipline to sit and let it flow for that long, you got to, I mean, you got to be kind of strong to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely part of it. And there's also, it feels almost like, like I need to create a container for the ideas to bounce against each other and for all my experiences and all the ideas to merge in a different way. Because I, you can just write like, I don't know, like directly of like, this is what I know, or this is what somebody told me, but to take all of our experiences and learning and bring it into language that's understandable and find the right metaphor and find the flow. There's just something about having a container of your, it's literally for me, it's my body is a container and I have to let the discomfort happen so that new things come together. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, and sometimes some days it's just like effortless flow. Like I have an article that I'll be writing today and I can feel it. I'm like, this is gonna be, it's just gonna come out. And other days, like I wrote an article next, last week and it was a week of like, just like, okay, all right, I can do this. Cause it's a challenging topic. Um, God, but it's, I was just it's saying, is it joyful. the topic or is it how yeah. you're feeling that day or a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both for sure. Yeah, for sure. Last week I wrote about war and about what's happening and conflict and how to be in, in right relationship with what's happening in the world right now. So it was, it's heavy. I mean, I had to sit and yeah. do a lot of research around, okay, what is happening? And then run it through my compassion, basically, and, and my desire to help people see things from a different point of view. And that's what I love writing about is tension, is like, we want it to be simple, and there is a way that it is simple, but the simplicity is that learning how to hold the contradictions mm -hmm. and getting big enough to understand that two things can be true at the same time. And how do we metabolize that in our bodies? How do we show up in challenging situations and have our hearts stay open? Oh my so gosh. Hard and beautiful. Talk about that all day. Yeah. And I love yes. what you just said. Simplicity yeah. is being able to hold contradiction. I think the molecules in my brain just exploded. That is amazing. <laughs> but this, the, that, that it really is simplicity, right? I've had so many, um, at the time of this recording, you know, there's obviously a, a massive conflict in the Middle East happening. And I've heard so many people refer to it and say, you know, this is not a soccer match. That's not what this is. This isn't what side are you on? This is like humanity at large expressing something incredibly painful. What are we going to do with this? Yes. And I love what you just shared about being able to do the research understand as, as fully as anyone can that th these human relationships are so complex, especially when they're layers of millennia on top of it, but to, to understand to the best of our ability. And then I love what you said. This is so powerful is to filter it through your own heart, your own compassion, your own openness. I almost want to say your own knowing. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Amazing. And I think, you know, I've had so many people say, Sarah, I don't know what to do with this. Do I talk about it? Do I not talk about it? like what's happened? It's like, you got to go through your own knowing. Like, what do you know? What do you feel? What do you express? Or you don't have to say anything. It's okay too, but to really be with our own intuition and, and hearts on this. I love that you share that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. 
So book one, tough, threw it out, started over, take two. And then we bought the other nine, other eight, sorry, the other eight, nine total. Like how in the world do you pick what you're going to write about next? Oh my God. I have so, I have so many ideas. Like there's <laughs> always, like I have four books floating about. The next one was really interesting because I was, I had a center in Austin and uh, a lot of, there was a big community. I'd written the first book and I, my whole life fell apart. So my relationship fell apart. The center started falling apart. Like just everything started cracking. And my publisher came to me and was like, what's your next book? And I'm like, Randy, I don't have anything in me. Like I'm going through a divorce. My whole world is falling apart. And he's like, oh, honey, I get you. He's like, okay, what have you written before? So I handed him something I'd written that was up for a program, like it was, it was a, a writing for a class that I had done. Okay. And he's like, this isn't it. He's like, what else do you got? And I'm like, all right, I have this book I wrote for like this program for a course that I wrote for women. And he's like, that's it. Give it to me. And so I handed over and it was literally I had I had moved from California to Texas. I had a group of people that wanted to continue to study with me. And this was in the time before Zoom. And we just got creative. We we're like, let's just do calls every month on the phone. And so we did two hour calls. I wrote something every month just based on what I was feeling, what they needed. And that writing Randy turned into, and we worked together to become Warrior Goddess Trading. And that book, the, the day it launched on Amazon, it went number one in goddesses and number one in shamanism. And it stayed there for four years. Holy cannoli. It just resonated. Yes. It just hit that, it hit that spot that everybody needed at that best. time. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was, what did that feel like for you as a human on this planet to know oh that God. something you created did that for other people? It was, yeah, it, makes, it brings tears to my eyes now. It was such a fulfillment because I'd worked with different communities and and had always said, like, I will find a way to bring all of this together because I had many different communities and like bring the teachings together that everyone can get it. And so to have had something resonate so much and know that it was going out and helping women, especially find their grounding and their voice and and their courage was just mm -hmm. immense. And I still, I just feel so blessed every day. Next year is the 10 year anniversary of Warrior mm -hmm. Goddess Training. And it's still selling. It's still like affecting, which is so rare. Like it's such a gift. It is. It really is. And that's so, I'm glad you just said 10 years. Cause I was going to say, what year was this actually launched mm -hmm. out onto the planet? Yeah. Um, and what were we all doing? Right. So it's yeah. like, and it's a different world. Yeah. Yeah. I just asked my publisher, I'm like, can we do a 10 year anniversary and do a new introduction? Cause the world's so different than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. 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 But yeah. also but, interesting to note, massive, massive human principles stay the same. Okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. cool. So I want to talk to you about dance a little bit too, because I know you talk about like this contradiction in movement that happens in dance. I really want to bring this to light for people now that we've talked about the contradiction, even in writing, right? Like the, the tension you have to hold and yet the flow at the same time. Yes. Is this something similar? Yeah, it's something similar. Like, you know, as you can, like, I am a very kinesthetic person and I really see our relationship with life as this dance and mm -hmm. that we're learning how to be in a way better dance partners, like more present, more grounded, more ready for anything. And so in our lives as beings that are in a world that is very surprising and like there's been lots of upheaval over the years that if we think about, okay, how do I become a better dance partner? How, how do I get more grounded? How do I get more present? How do I support this being that I am mm. in relationship with what is happening in my world? And it's not about changing the world. And it's not about fixing yourself. You're not broken. Like so often when I'm working with, with women, it's like, you're not broken. You just have a lot of beliefs and patterns and habits that aren't serving. Let's fix those. So it's a beautiful metaphor to use. It really is. I know. I really appreciate that. In all of your work with women, where do we pick up this idea? I think I know, but I really love your perspective on this. Where do we pick up this idea that we're broken and we need fixing? You know, there's, we live in a patriarchal society. We live in a society that is very much still based in men are more important than women. Mm -hmm. Women are secondary. And it's so interesting because in the modern world, it looks like, especially in the West, because this isn't true all around the world for women, it looks like women have an incredible amount of freedom. We can have any job we want. We can start our own businesses. We can 
mate with anybody we want to, basically. There's a, a ton of external freedom, which has created an illusion I've seen that we should have it all together on the inside. But the truth is, it was it was like a little bit over 100 years ago that women in the United States got the right to vote. And it was the 60s when women of color got the right to vote. This is in our lifetime. Yeah. And for many things that are changing. And so we, we're we not free on the inside. Many of us are not yet free on the inside. We've picked up agreements that we're not enough, that we have to be perfect, that we have to take care of everybody else, that there's a right way and that there's a wrong way. There's a, We're very much in a reward punishment model. Mm. And because of that, we tend to think when something happens inside of us or when we can't create the business or when we're struggling with our family, I'm at fault, something's wrong, I'm broken. It's where we tend to go to much of the time or blame, like it's because of this out there. And my work is helping us untangle those old beliefs and agreements that we've taken on from our family, from our religion, from our peers that we make up because we're so creative <laughs> and we are. And I always say like, you're super creative. Let's just take the creativity away from punishing or blaming or judging ourselves and put it towards creating what we want to create. But it takes time to undo yes. the old patterns. Well, I think also understanding the reward punishment society is patriarchal, right? Like yeah. in and of itself, that whole idea that it's black or white, it's this or that, you know, that's a very masculine way to yeah. approach the planet as opposed to what we always joke about, a woman whose mind has 85,000 tabs open, right? It's because we can see the complexity and the nuance of all of the different things and the way that they're connected and that there is not one right way. There are yeah. many that can be beneficial and many that can be harmful and finding that internal rhythm. I love that. And then I know you also had quite the experience with wildfires <laughs> and your business. And I would love for you to share this story because I think, look, there's what's going on in the world is challenging, right? How do we run a business through that? And then there's also when our own lives blow up, like you said, everything went wrong and they're like, where's the book? And you're like, I don't know, right? How did you navigate this? Talk to us about that. Share a little bit about that journey. Yeah, one of my dreams for a long time has been to have a, a retreat center that was off grid, that was could help people connect to the land and to get quiet and to disconnect from all the, the noise that we have in the modern world. And so I think it's been four or five years ago, I, built, I was blessed to buy 180 acres of land outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So we're up against the Santa Fe National Forest. And we had just finished the community kitchen and we're ready to do the next phase. We had bought a 30 foot yurt that was unput to get, like it was in piles still. Wow. Um, and April 6th last year, a huge wildfire started in, um, it was a planned wildfire that got out of control and it burned, it was the largest fire in New Mexico. And I knew like, at first I was like, ah, it's far away. But like three one weeks in, I was like, we're going to lose the retreat center. It's going to go. I could just feel it in my body and there's nothing to do. Mm. Um, so I started helping my community and like, get, cause so many people got like lost their homes, lost their livelihoods. And when the fire went through, it was just this like surrender of like, this is what's happening on the planet. Like mm. climate emergency thing, like weather patterns. And so it was devastating. We managed to evacuate the yurt and the firefighters managed to save the core of the land around the building, but we lost 90% of our forest. Oh, yeah, they're All the animal, I mean, it's just, it was heartbreaking. And so suddenly my vision of like, I have a five-year vision of building a retreat center for humans shifted drastically and I had to sit with it for a long time of like do I continue forward do we just walk away from the land and let it heal and I just got a really clear knowing like no you're you committed to steward this land now you're stewarding this land is different but it's still your responsibility to partner with the land so now it's we've put the yurt up we just finished a bathhouse where we have two bathrooms and two showers um, I'm doing retreats up there now it's a cross between Mordor and Narnia <laughs> it's like four door Narnia had a baby. That's the property. So, oh my gosh, I so just geeked out with you on that. Oh that was God. amazing. Yeah, there's I all these it. wildflowers and like just impossible things growing, and then death, like all these dead ponderosa oh pine trees. Well, but yeah. isn't that life? 
I mean, it, exactly. I mean, isn't that just the analogy that we all have to live with? And had someone on on the podcast a bit ago during 2020 when you know Black Lives Matter, all the ugliness that we were seeing in in humanity mm-hmm. and the way that we can behave, much like we're seeing today. Yeah. And it was just this constant reminder for her: find the beauty, because even when there's war, there's beauty. Find the beauty, and I think that's what you're describing too about your retreat center and taking mm-hmm. the time to sit with that internal knowing the way that you just said that do you know the story of jamie kearns lima she's the founder of it cosmetics no she's just she talks about the inner knowing she heard no about her cosmetics that she created to to solve her own problem right but she doesn't fit the normal beauty standard so she had to really work through that in the beauty industry and she heard no for i want to say it was four years and she was down to her last thousand dollars and she said but there was this internal knowing in the face of the no Mm. beautiful Yes. She sold her business for $1.4 billion. (laughs) The internal, I know, right? It's like happy dance. Let's get that money in the hands. Let's get that energy into the hands of women, right? Like, let's see what happens on the planet. The way you just said that really reminded me of that. I'll put the link to that book in the show notes, because I think it's one of those, the way that you are talking about that. And I'm sure you talk about it in your books as well. And the way she talks about it in that book, I think, and you're so different, right? But this, this thing that connects women when you speak about like the beauty, the death, all of the things, and yet that internal knowing and the way that you filter your books through that and the way that you know that your writing comes out through that and then watching someone coming in from the corporate side saying the exact same thing, there is this beautiful invisible thread for all. Abs- yeah, and that that deep listening. And, and now my vision is 50 years, how do I help restore the land? How do I help feed the bears and the hummingbirds You know, for decades to come? And so- Sometimes those sort of tragedies or those sort of like, I'm down to my last, like there's something larger at work that we have to surrender to, or we get to surrender to, we don't have to do anything, but we get to surrender to and listen and trust and keep going. I love that. I think that's so true. The darkest before the dawn phrase, right? I mean, that didn't come out of nowhere. That feeling of like, what is this for? And then trusting the knowing inside. You must have had to do that during that fire. That must have been quite a sense of mourning too. Right. Yeah. Of lots loss of grief. Vision, the way you thought it was going to go. Yeah. Lots of grief, lots of, and heartbreak. And mm-hmm. it's also beauty. That's part of life. Like I've really, it's one of the things that I've learned to within our community is like the importance of grieving, the importance of being in relationship to our feelings. Cause that allows us to then really show up with more love. It creates more space for more love. Cause that's all grief is. It's, it's mourning what we love. Yeah, you can't have grief without love, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. It's so good. So good. Heather Ash, if someone's listening right now and they've, they're have they just being introduced to your world, what is one thing that you wish more people knew about you? That I am a wonderful mix of playfulness and deep, practical seriousness. How do we get shit done? <laughs> A woman after my own heart. You just made me so happy. You have no idea. (laughs) I love that. I love that. And now if someone's listening and they're like, I need me some more of Heather Ash, where can people find you? Where can people learn out more about you, about your retreat center and about how they can work with you? Uh, Best place is the website warriorgoddess.com. And then also my Substack is where I'm doing the most alive writing right now, which is heatherash.substack.com. I love it. All right, you guys, we are going to have those links underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube or in the show notes if you're listening in. Heather Ash, this has just been such a joy to get to talk to you today. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing on the planet and for helping more and more women find that internal freedom and liberty that we've all been looking for. Thanks so much, Sarah, for all you do as well. It's a joy to be on the show with you.